Good morning. Uh, I want to begin this morning by inviting you to pray. Um, and there's two specific things I would like for you to pray for. Uh, first thing I'd like you to pray for is to thank God for His grace. Okay? You wouldn't be here this morning if it wasn't for the grace of God Almighty. We wouldn't be able to call Him Father if it wasn't for the grace of God Almighty. We are here as a people immensely grateful for the gift of Jesus Christ to this world. So we're going to pray thanking God for His grace. Uh, and then number two... I would ask that you would pray for God to help you to be more gracious. Um, if you're anything at all like me, there are opportunities in your life to be more gracious to the people around us. Again, we are supposed to be becoming more like Jesus, and that means being a people who are extending grace towards one another. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to take just a minute uh, to pray silently for these two things. Uh, and at the end of that, I will close us in prayer. Uh, so let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray all this in his holy name. Amen. All right, uh, we are currently partway through our sermon series on the five GCC core values. Uh, this is a sermon series that has been in process for months. Uh, many months ago, our leadership team started work on this particular series, uh, and we are doing this for a lot of reasons. We very intentionally want to continue growing as a church. Uh, this church has grown uh, considerably over the years, and we want to continue doing that. We feel like part of the way that we will continue to grow is by very specifically setting out our core key values. Okay? These are the things that are part of our DNA as a church. Uh, these are the things that we are going to be very intentional about not changing as we continue to grow and develop as a church. Uh, we feel like these are some of the reasons why people will drive by other churches to come and worship here. Uh, and so this is stuff that we want to commit to and commit to being a part of as a church. And uh, so we began this last week and we talked about the very first value. Uh, and our first value is that we are a church that celebrates grace. Okay, hence the prayer that we just prayed. Uh, talking about grace and thinking about being a people who are gracious towards others. We recognize that a lot of people end up here at GCC because they are wounded, or they have baggage, or they have needs. And we want to be a loving family that helps people heal. Uh, many of us, myself included, have found this to be a place that has helped us to heal and to get past some of the things that we brought here with us. Uh, now, we are not perfect at this, but we feel like this is a distinct strength of this church. And we want to continue to lean into that and be that as we grow into the future. Uh, we feel like if we could only be known for one thing as a church, let it be that we are a grace-filled church. Fair enough? That should have gotten an amen. Where'd JJ go? Okay. He's in the back somewhere. All right. Y'all are going to have to pick up the slack if he's not in here. I need some, some assurance that I'm, I'm actually talking to some real people. All right. Thank you. Okay, and uh, for number two, our second value, uh, we recognize that our grace should lead us somewhere. Okay, God isn't giving us grace just so that we can celebrate and be happy just in and of ourselves. Okay, God gives us grace, and then he expects us to grow. Okay, the first step of growth is actually grace. And so our second value uh, what we're going to talk about this morning is that we are a church with a commitment to growth. Right, and to get at this value, uh, I want to look at a passage of Scripture. This is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right, this is one small paragraph in the book of Acts. And in this paragraph, Luke is giving us a snapshot of the first church. Okay, and if you read the story right before this one, uh, you would see how in the first 40 verses of Acts chapter 2, it's Pentecost, and the Apostle Peter stands up and preaches an amazing sermon, convicting all of the people assembled there that Jesus really is Lord. And so about 3,000 people in one day are baptized and form the church in Jerusalem, the very first church. It's the birthday of the church. Okay, that's what you read right before this text. Okay, and so now we get a glimpse of what that very first church was like and how God took that small group of believers and it's going to be this group of people that ultimately he will spread throughout the entire world uh, and they will convert the world to Jesus. Okay, the gospel will go to every corner of God's creation. Okay, it's very compact, it's exciting, it's a little paragraph of scripture. And if you want to talk about church growth, this is a really good place to read about how it happened at first. Okay, so the first thing I want to ask about our text this morning is, is the kind of religion that we see here, is their practice of Christianity that we read here at the end of Acts 2, is this something that you can do in an hour a week? That's not rhetorical. I'm actually asking that as a question. Is this something you can do in an hour a week? No. Okay, is this uh, a little nice side hobby for these people? No. No. Uh, was Christianity for them something that was really just kind of an intellectual exercise? It was a list of beliefs that you had to assent to, and you could mostly just keep that to yourself, and so long as you didn't bother anybody else with those beliefs, then everything was fine? That was really long, but I'm also going for a no on that one, okay? No, they were devoted to these things. Okay, the very first verb in this paragraph is talking about these people's devotion. Okay, so here's our first point. Okay, Christianity doesn't work as an add-on to your life. Christianity only works if it's the devotion of your life. JJ, that was your cue. Was to, amen right there. Thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, when I was a kid, um, I was a baseball player. I played Little League Baseball. Um, I had great dreams of being the second baseman for the Atlanta Braves. But I didn't practice every day. I didn't study baseball every day. Uh, I certainly didn't work out every day. Okay, so even if I had had more natural talent than I did have, how far was I going to go with baseball? Yeah, not very. Why? Because growth doesn't happen in an hour a week. Okay, growth comes out of devotion. Right, if you're taking notes, I've left you some blanks on the bulletin. Write this one down. Okay, growth comes out of devotion. All right, the second part of this is that following Jesus is not only a devotion kind of thing, but it is a very costly proposition. Okay, notice again verse 45 in the first part of 46. It talks about this first church. It says, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Okay, so if we started having daily worship services, y'all would all come every day, right? That's a show of hands. Nobody, okay, just checking. Okay, not only do these first Christians sell possessions and give up their time in order to be with each other, but do you know what happened to these first Jews who gave up their Jewishness in so many ways in order to follow Jesus? They got kicked out of synagogues. They lost business. They lost family. If their whole family didn't convert, they lost whatever part of their family didn't convert because they looked, their old family looked at them as having followed some heresy now as they're following Jesus. Okay, to follow Jesus wasn't easy for these people. It cost them a lot. Okay, growth doesn't just require devotion. It requires sacrifice. You know, I love the idea of going to bed early. I love the idea uh, of eating healthily. 
Okay? I love the idea of exercise. Okay? I love the idea of reading the classics. Okay, so, why don't I go to bed early? If I love the idea, why don't I do it? Uh, because Netflix isn't going to watch itself, right? Uh, my Xbox isn't going to play itself. Okay, why don't I eat healthier? Uh, because have you tasted ice cream? Have you tasted bacon? Have you tasted all the unhealthy stuff? Eating unhealthy is really delicious, right? Okay, um, I love the idea of reading the classics, so why don't I do it? Okay, because I don't care if Moby Dick is the great American classic, it's really dull, right? And it's thick. I'm not reading that. It's not going to happen. Okay, if I was really going to get serious about growth in any of those things, what would I have to do? I'll give you a hint, okay? Uh, I would have to sacrifice. I'd have to make sacrifices somewhere else in my life to make space for those things that I like the idea of, but I don't like the sacrifice as much as I like the idea of those things, and so I don't do them. Okay, actual growth would require sacrifice. You know, I heard a great interview the other day uh, with Max Licato, uh, who has published a mountain of best-selling books, and the interviewer asked him how he's gotten so many books written over the course of his ministry, and Max Licato's answer was that his golf game is terrible. That's a good answer, right? He also said that as a pastor, he doesn't spend a lot of time visiting people in the hospital or doing administrative things at his church or being involved in the meetings and planning sessions that they have at his church. Okay? Why doesn't he do all of those things? Okay, because you can't do everything, and he is intentional about sacrificing even good things in order to do what he feels for him and his ministry is his most important thing. Does that make sense? You see where I'm going with all that? Okay, if you're only going to hear me say one thing this morning, let it be this. Okay, and that is that everybody loves the idea of growth in the abstract. Okay, we like the idea of growth. But when it comes time to make sacrifice to make it happen, we find that a whole lot more difficult. Okay, getting spiritual. Uh, we love the idea of reading the Bible in a year. Okay? Or maybe you've tried before, you know, I'm going to commit to praying for 30 minutes every day. Okay, but what happens in your daily Bible reading when you get to about the second half of Exodus? Okay? When you get to where they're going through all the specifics for how they built the first tabernacle and it's chapter after chapter of just building materials, you're like, man, this is tough, right? Or in your 30 minutes of prayer every day that you're really going to do and make a great New Year's resolution, um, so you sit down and I'm going to do this, and then after about five minutes, you've run out of sick people to pray for and stuff that you want God to do for you, and you're like, okay, so it's been five, now what am I supposed to do, Right? We love the idea of those things in the abstract, but when it comes to actually doing them, it gets a whole lot harder. Okay, we love to give money to church when it's out of our, ac our excess. Okay, it's a whole lot harder for me to give money at church when I have to sacrifice to do it. Okay, we love the idea of evangelism. Okay, we want to preach to the lost. Okay, but please don't ask me to initiate a conversation with my neighbor about Jesus. All right, it's a lot harder. Uh, we love the idea of ministering effectively to our children. Just don't ask me to volunteer to help. Okay, we love the idea of being a welcoming church. But am I willing to give up singing my favorite songs? Or am I willing to give up parking close to the church building, having to park far away in order to be welcoming? I mean, yeah, Jesus can go to the cross... But if I have to walk across a wet horse pasture to come to church, then forget it. It's funny, but it's not. Okay, we love the idea of growth, but are we willing to sacrifice anything for it? All right, uh, in addition to devotion and sacrifice, the final piece of this that we see here in Acts 2 uh, is that growth also requires an outward focus. Okay. Growth requires an outward focus. Uh, you remember the story in Mark chapter 10 where a rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, keep the commandments. And the guy says, well, let me go through the top 10. Yeah, I've done that. 
And Jesus says, okay, great. Only one more thing do you lack. I want you to sell your stuff and give it to the poor. And what does the man do? He turns away and says, yeah, I can't do that. Okay, the rich guy leaves because he doesn't want to do that. Okay, that story in the church that we read about in Acts and many other scriptures in both the Old and the New Testament show us that God's plan for his people has never just been for us to sit in a little conclave and keep all of the commandments to ourselves. Okay? If all it was about was us being good, just me and God, and I don't have to worry about anybody else, then the rich young man would have been fine. But he wasn't fine because everything was just about him and God, and he wasn't doing anything for anybody else around him. The church in Acts didn't grow because they were just keeping to themselves. They grew because they had an outward focus. We as a church can't just care about ourselves. We can't just have an internal perspective. We have to have a focus that cares about them, Right? Remember our mission statement. Okay, we are a loving family. Okay, that's about us. We're living for God, and we're serving them. Okay, we're serving our neighbors. So, uh, let's get super practical and talk about what growth looks like for us at GCC. Okay, um, two big points on this, and I was meaning to put those up one at a time, but you can go ahead and see all of them right now. Uh, Write these down as well. Okay, but the first thing about us being a church that wants to grow is that we are committed to being an asset to our local community. You think about all of the different things that we do here. If this neighborhood around us, if this city of Lawrenceville, if the county of Gwinnett didn't care whether we are here or not, uh, then we've missed it. If we closed up shop tomorrow and, and put signs on our doors that said closed for business, Uh, And if the church, I'm sorry, if the community around us didn't care, uh, then we're doing it wrong, right? We are supposed to be, and we strive to be, an asset to our local community. Uh, We do this in a lot of different ways. Think about how every spring we have our community fair. We're trying to serve the community. You think about the co-op, where every single month we staff the Lawrenceville co-op that specifically serves the poor in this community by providing them with food. We have a lot of folks that volunteer for that and are part of that ministry every single month. You think about what we did here just a couple of Sundays ago where we had our Living the Sermon Day where we sent teams out specifically to serve our neighbors in this community. Think about what we have coming up in a couple of weeks with our trunk or treat. We'll have a couple of hundred kids on our property who we're going to give candy to um, and hopefully we'll give them a good feeling about what we do here as a church and about who we are, right? We have special Easter and Christmas services designed to help people who are looking for an inroad into church. We're getting ready in another few weeks to have our bonfire and hayride, which we hope to invite people from our community to come and be a part of. Uh, We have our preschool here, uh, where we have educational opportunities for the community. Uh, We support Georgia Agape with the the, um, orphans, specifically, who need that ministry. We have blood drives. We have elections here. We send groups to feed the homeless down in Atlanta. Uh, There's other things that I forgot to put on my list here that I'm reading to you right now. But there's a lot of ways that we as the church here at GCC want to be an asset to our local community because we think it matters. We don't want to be just focused on us. We want to love other people and not just love them, but specifically love them in the name of Jesus. Fair enough? All right. Second part of that is not only do we believe in doing ministry locally, we are committed to global missions. Uh, currently, our two biggest global initiatives are the work that we're doing digging wells in Ghana. Uh, that's the first one, the one we've had for the longest time. Currently, we're on well number 16 over in Ghana. And you think about the thousands of people that have access to clean water because of the wells that we have dug over on the other side of the world. And more importantly than that, you think of all the churches that get planted at every well that we put and the people that are coming to hear about Jesus for the very first time because of the wells that we're digging over in Ghana. That's a big deal. Our other big global ministry that we're a part of right now uh, is the work that we're doing in Austria. Uh, As part of that work, they've had over 50 baptisms this year. Okay? primarily working with refugees who are going into Austria from the Middle East and from places where they're facing persecution just for being Christians. 
Okay, we enjoy getting to worship God with no fear whatsoever, but we recognize that there are brothers and sisters of ours around the world who don't have that luxury. We want to be a part of supporting them. We want to be a part of what they're doing. Okay, in the past here at GCC, we've supported efforts in India and Tanzania and other places. Uh, in the future, we'll probably have opportunities to be involved in other countries around the world. Okay, and we do this because we recognize that we are a part of the church that extends around the globe. And so to be involved in foreign missions, okay, especially missions that serve parts of the world that are underserved okay, or are just new to the gospel in a way that they haven't been in prior years, okay, that's a tremendous opportunity. Right? Part of growth is not about specifically growing GCC it's about growing the kingdom of God that is so much bigger than we could ever be, right? We're a part of something that's so much bigger than we can even imagine. That's important. All right. Uh, so that's part of what growth looks like for us as a church. Okay, but there's another side of this that has to go right along with it. Uh, part of our commitment to grow is not just about these bigger things. Uh, it gets much more personal, and so my next question is, what does growth look like for me? Okay, and all of you should be asking that same question, right? What does growth look like for you? Uh, and this isn't exhaustive, but three quick points to close on this. Okay, number one, what does growth look like for you? Uh, I should invite people to church and events. Okay? Uh, each one of us should have people in our lives that we are inviting to the things that are going on here. Okay, each one of us should have people that we are praying for, that they would come to know Jesus and that they would come to be here with us. Uh, the other day I heard a church growth stat. Alan sent this one to me. Uh, but it's that if a church wants to grow, they must welcome a number of guests annually at least equal to its weekly attendance. Okay, in other words, what that means is if we don't have at least 200 guests coming through our building every year, uh, then we're not on a path to real growth. And now, uh, we as a church do have that number. Okay? We have more than 200 guests that visit our church every single year. Uh, and part of what that means for each one of you is that all of us can do a better job of helping guests feel welcome here. Okay? Meeting people, smiling at people. Uh, not all of us are the most outgoing people, but everybody can shake someone's hand and make them feel welcome. Okay? All of us can help our new members assimilate and find their place and establish connections with each other. Okay? Because it turns out that the primary reason people stay at a church is not because of brilliant preaching from a good-looking, funny minister. The primary reason people stay at a church is because of the connections they make with each other. It's because they get involved in other people's lives, they get involved in ministries, they get plugged in. Okay? All of us have a responsibility to help, especially our new members and guests, to start plugging in and making those connections. Fair enough? And you're all going to do that? It's going to be great? All right. Number next. Not only should you invite people to what we're doing here, uh, but I should volunteer at our church and events. Uh, did you know that VBS this last summer took right around 60 volunteers. That's a lot. Uh, by the way, uh, our plan for doing VBS next year um, is we're going to start with a list of those 60 slots and try to get enough volunteers to fill all of those slots. And if we don't, then we have to scale back how much ministry we're actually able to do. Okay? Because we can only do as much ministry as we have volunteers and people willing to serve, right? That makes sense? Okay, you don't need to volunteer for everything that we do or be a part of every ministry, but all of us should be volunteering somewhere, okay, and most of us could be a whole lot more involved than we are. Is that fair? Everybody needs a ministry, okay? And there's stuff that everybody can do. All right, number next. I should be on a plan for personal, spiritual growth. Okay, each one of us needs to be on a growth trajectory in how we follow Jesus. 
Okay, as we've said before, and we hit it really hard last week in our, our lesson on grace, uh, but we are happy for you to come to us in whatever place you are in your walk with Jesus, but you shouldn't stay there. Okay? All of us should be growing. We should all be growing more into the image of Jesus. Okay, and this is part of your responsibility. Um, whenever I was in college, my freshman year at Oklahoma Christian, I had to take a composition class, which was basically how to write a research paper. Right? And the one big project for the entire semester was you had to write this research paper and turn it in at the end of the semester. Now, uh, that was really easy for me uh, because I went to a high school that emphasized the writing of research papers. In fact, my senior year in high school, I wrote a bigger research paper than I had to do my freshman year at college. So I went into that class. I already knew how to use the library. I already knew how to write stuff. Uh, I already knew how to do all my research and to get it all put together. Uh, I was about 80% of the way there based on classes I had taken back in high school because I had the advantage of going to a good high school. So my first draft for that paper was my last draft for that paper. And it was easy and it was one of the breezy courses that I got through and went on with my life. There were other kids in that class that didn't go to high schools as good as the one I went to. And for a lot of those kids, that was the first research paper they had ever written. Okay? Where I started off at about the 80% done mark, they were starting at about the 10% done place. Okay? Uh, many of them didn't know where the library was on campus. Right? Uh, they didn't know how to use the resources. They didn't know how to write a paper. They didn't get to make their first draft their last draft. They had to write lots and lots of drafts. Now, did the professor in the course care whether you started at the 80% mark or the 10% mark, or did she just care that we all turned in a research paper at the end of the day? Now, is it fair that I got to start at 80% and other kids started at 10%? No. But is it reality? Yes. Okay, here's where I'm going with this, and my metaphor breaks down. Okay, but some of you grew up with great Christianity modeled for you at home. Okay, you were raised in a pew, uh, you came to GCC as mature Christians, uh, and you're starting off at about the 80% mark, right? Some of you didn't get to learn the Bible stories as children. Some of you, whenever I say, hey, you remember the story about such and such, you're going, nope, I haven't heard that one before. Okay, some of you didn't have all of those advantages, and you're coming in much closer to that 10% mark than the 80% mark. Is that fair? No, <laughs> it's not fair, okay, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to worry about maturity, okay, it just means it's going to be a longer journey for you, okay, the expectation for all of us is the same, we're supposed to become like Jesus, okay? and by the way, even if you came in here and you feel like you're at the 80% mark, you still got a long way to go, okay, uh, how many of us are ready to raise our hand and say we're just like Jesus, okay. Yeah, not today. He's already been taken out of church once this morning, so I guarantee you that's not, that's not where he's at. So part of what that means for us as members here at GCC is that we believe quite strongly in the spiritual disciplines, right? How's your prayer life? Are you reading your Bible regularly? Uh, how about giving? How about hospitality? Okay, what are the things that we can do that Scripture talks about, the ways that we can continue to make sure that we are connecting to God, that we are continuing to grow into Him? How are we continually living lives of reflection where we're spending time looking in the mirror and asking ourselves, what is it in my life that I need to work on? What do I need to change? Where do I need to get support? Who else do I need to rely on? Who else can I get to mentor me? What else can I be doing with these disciplines so that I can continue growing and becoming more like Jesus? Uh, as we talked about this last Sunday, okay, everyone should be a part of four basic things that we do here at GCC. All right? If you are a member here, you should be involved in these four things. You should be involved in our worship services. Okay? Um, you should be involved in education. Right? We have lots of opportunities for Bible classes on both Sundays and Wednesdays. We've got lots of individual opportunities. I'll give book recommendations for other things if you want a specific area of study, all sorts of different ways. 
Uh, we already talked about all the different service opportunities that we have. There are lots of opportunities for you to get involved in the ministries that we are doing here. Everybody should be a part of ministry. Everybody should be a part of serving other people. Okay? Also, you should be involved in fellowship. Right? If you're coming in late and leaving early and nobody knows you, and then you'd be like, well, that church wasn't very nice to me. I'm like, well, you never gave us a chance to talk to you. Right? Uh, all of us should be involved in things like our connection groups, our men's fellowship groups, the ladies' class on Wednesdays, different opportunities that we have to connect to each other in real ways. We cannot be the kind of church that we talked about in Acts chapter 2 where they were devoted to each other unless we're also spending time with each other. Okay? That's part of it. And by the way, uh, final thought on this. Your child or your teenager shouldn't have a choice in this. Okay? Um, for my children, I'll speak just about me, as long as they're living in my house, they're going to come to church, right? Um, I'm tired of hearing the excuse that I hear from some parents of, well, my kid doesn't want to come, okay? Um, if they don't get to choose whether or not they go to school every day, they also don't get to choose whether or not they come to church, okay? That's a choice that we as parents make for our children, until they become adults, and then they can make their own choices. But while they're kids, that choice is on us as parents. All right? All of us should be involved in personal growth. We care about growth as a church with the whole church, and also about us as individuals, because ultimately we are all trying to become more like Jesus. All right. At this time in our service, we are going to sing a couple of verses of an invitation song. Uh, during the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. This is a time in our service where we as the church want to be here for you. We would love to talk with you or pray with you about anything that is going on in your life. Ultimately, we just want to be the church to you. Um, and before we sing that song, I'd like to close us with a word of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Let's stand and sing.